Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you as we continue on uh, all of our offseason chatter with K-State football because, you know, there have been some changes despite the fact that Chris Kleiman has really kept a lot of consistency from 2019 to what's now going to be the 2024 season, which is kind of crazy in, in the way college football works these days uh, where, you know, obviously they dealt with the loss of Scotty Hazleton early on. But, you know, you, you you made, obviously, the Courtney Messingham change. But a lot of these guys have been around for a while, and it feels like the change at offensive coordinator in that position is probably the most seismic since Chris Kleiman has been here because you're doing a couple of different things with it. Connor Riley is going to go into a role that he's never had before as the OC, and you bring in a guy in Matt Wells who's obviously really talented and has quite the resume to have a co-OC and quarterbacks coach job after being the head coach at Texas Tech for two and a half season, I, I guess it would be. So they spoke last week to the media. We talked already this week a little bit about how Matt Wells is helping or what his role will be in the recruiting space. But in terms of how these guys are going to work the K-State offense, what was your biggest takeaway from both of them speaking last week? Yeah, I know to your first point, talking about – you know, the consistency within the coaching staff, that's that's definitely the case. Um, they had to replace Ted Monachino as well, right? Just after a couple of days. Yeah, never um, forget. Never never forget Ted Monachino. I think he had a picture with the staff. Um, he did. Yeah, the first picture was with him in it as the defensive coordinator. And then, of course, the revolving door that has been the wide receiver coach, right? I think we've had a different wide receiver coach each season. And unless something – unforeseen happens this will be i think the first time that the wide receiver coach will be the same one two seasons in a row so matthew middleton making history at kansas state under chris climate um in terms of what we kind of acknowledged and, and learned you, you know obviously connor riley is going to be your primary play caller and and matt wells will probably help incorporate some passing concepts in there and of course be the tutor um mentor and coach for the quarterback specifically Avery Johnson obviously so we'll see how that meshes I imagine Matt Wells will be on the field we know Brian LaPack will be on the field we know Connor Riley will be up in the booth um and as the offensive line coach that's why LaPack's going back down to the field he was he was an offensive lineman so he'll be able to kind of be that secondary offensive line type of dude um, on the coaching staff now that Connor Riley's in the booth because obviously you need someone talking to them during uh, during the game. So, yeah, we'll see how it all – how the pieces fit. Um, I was impressed by the stage presence of both. Um, seemed very comfortable in their own skin and their new roles in front of the media for the first time. Well, real quick before we dive into some of the things that they said, but you got the nugget of, hey, we'll pack on the field, Riley in the booth. How much of an impact do you think that has, and, and what kind of change will that be for Connor Riley, who has been a guy on the field and going up there? And it, you, he just has to look at the game in a different way now, very similar to how, like, people watching on TV, you see the game differently than people in person. Or if you're watching a game and, you know, you hear the analysts, the analysts on these football games, they watch the game in a totally different way. Connor Riley is now watching the game in a totally different way for K-State, and he's also doing it in a different spot on the field. So, I mean, how much of an impact might that really have on K-State? Well, I think he admitted it during the press conference that it does have a sizable impact on, on what his role is and how life changes for him because, you know, when you're on the field, you get a feel for the players. You have that consistent dialogue with your guys repeatedly up in the booth. I mean, other than a guy getting on the headset and talking to you, you don't really have that. Now, you need to continue to seek information from your coaches that are on the field who are getting engaged for what the players are feeling, hearing, and saying as well. But you're just – it's a little bit different when it's almost – you're up there on an island, right, just reading the tea leaves that are in front of you on the football field. So it's different, um, really different for an offensive line coach probably as well because – you coach more guys than anyone at one time as well. So um, it'll be different and um, they'll have to navigate that and adjust on the fly as they see fit in terms of if things occur, hurdles happen here and there. 
I imagine that Brian Lepak is going to be leaned on maybe eventually even heavily in that area than they are even maybe foreseeing at this point. Uh, real quick, before we move further, here's a picture of Ted Monachino in K-State gear. He was photographed and everything. I think he even had a spot up on the website. So uh, that he, that was the real deal for a little bit. Uh, he was He was there and then left for the Chicago Bears. This is a sidebar. Nobody cares about this, but I want to ask you. So after, he he left the D.C. job at K-State before, you know, I think a month to go be with the Bears to be a defensive assistant and outside linebackers coach for two seasons. Then he was the outside linebackers coach for two years with the Falcons. Last year, he was an analyst with North Carolina, and this year he's their defensive line coach. So did Ted Monachino make the right call leaving K-State's D.C. job to go to the NFL? Because I don't think he did. Maybe the money is different, but that seems like that'd be a wild amount to pay an outside linebackers coach uh, compared to D.C. money in the Big 12. For his career trajectory, perhaps not. But we've seen it time and time again. We're watching it unfold in real time at the moment. But guys want to get to the NFL because you don't have to work. Look, look, essentially, you don't have to work all year round. Right now, in, the, in in college football, not only do you have to work year-round, you have to do multiple things all year-round. The calendar is that screwed up. I mean, Boston College's head coach just left to go be the defense coordinator for the Green Bay Packers. And we might be seeing yeah, and we might be seeing more and more of that, right? I mean, the office coordinator of Washington, they got hired to be the office coordinator in Alabama, left to be the office coordinator of the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, the NFL is a much comfier gig right now. Yeah. Just it's kind of it's a it's an interesting career path. Some guys, also, some, some guys don't like to recruit either. So whoever put his Wikipedia picture up, they did him dirty. He he does not look as dapper as he did uh, in his in his K State golf shirt. So that's just so it's like and, and it like didn't Bill Snyder hire Rex Ryan for a little bit? Yes, yes, yeah. Rex yeah. Ryan was a K State DC for uh, uh for a little bit before he he was not. Uh, all right. So what was actually said here is uh. Connor Riley on probably the, the biggest topic that uh, he'll want to talk about this year because everybody will want to hear about it. His thoughts on his quarterback, Avery Johnson. A ton of maturity, and really I didn't necessarily see all of that when he took the reins over the Monday after the Iowa State loss. Um, you've seen it since he's stepped foot on campus and uh, his desire to learn, his desire to compete. We all know what kind of – athlete he is, what kind of football player that he is, but uh, the character of who he is and um, what type of competitor he is, uh, that's that's exactly what we anticipated uh, going into that bowl game. So with Avery Johnson at quarterback and now Connor Riley being the OC, I mean, what what is that dynamic like and, and how confident are you that things are going to be set up the way that Avery Johnson can succeed and also want the offense to be, because I think we saw a pretty good job of that in the pop tarts bowl. I mean, you said it all the way in the lead up. I think every chance you got making it clear, like this is not going to be Avery Johnson running the ball 15 times a game. You know, there, there may be the offshoot chance that, Hey, the game calls for it like in Lubbock and you've got the ability, like just torch these guys, make it easy. But the guy's a gifted thrower too, and he wants to be a true quarterback, and he proved that in the NC State game. Yeah, he could be a true quarterback. To be honest, what he did best at the NC State game, it's not sexy, but it was throwing it away when it needed to be thrown away. Now, it did very little for his completion percentage because he yeah. had to throw it away a lot because his receivers were not open very much. So his numbers were not as good as what he played. There was a couple throws, especially on the run, where he skipped them. His mechanics were out of whack, and he didn't get it there. And I think may, maybe uh, a decision or two here may have won it back. I don't know. Uh, kind of hard to look back on it. But I just remember there was probably five to seven balls, I felt, five to seven plays where, like, we've seen time and time again, even the elite quarterbacks when they are true freshmen or when they are in their first career start, they're throwing up some prayers, right? They're they're throwing the ball into trouble. They're not throwing it away. They're they're trying to keep a play alive a little too long, get sacked, or they force it into a window they shouldn't get intercepted. He just didn't do that. 
Um, I think that goes to his preparation. I think that goes to his poise, um, his football intelligence, and like Connor Riley just said, there maturity, right? I mean, we've covered him. We've said both said this before. We've covered him since he was basically what, probably a 15, yeah. 15 yeah. 16 years old, and that kid, even at that time, you know, conducted himself both on and off the field like he was a grown man. Like he just. He's been a mature adult and someone that everyone flocks to and navigates to for as long as we've known him. Um, he's made for this. And like you said, does not want to be a runner that can throw it. He wants to be a thrower that can run it. And I thought that's how the game plan was built around him for the Pop-Tarts Bowl. And I really think that's what Connor Riley wants to do. Now, they're going to use his legs, but – you know, they want to, they know, they know he's got a special arm as well. How helpful is it for Connor Riley that his first time being an offensive coordinator, he gets a quarterback like Avery Johnson versus, I mean, I, I don't want to disparage anybody. So I'm, I'm trying to think of yeah, maybe a non K state no, no, quarterback to use, yeah. but like th there's a, a realm where he comes in his first year and he doesn't have as gifted of a quarterback as Avery yeah. Johnson and everything. No, he's fortunate. Uh, his first year is a primary play caller at any level, I believe. And he's probably going to have the most, perhaps the most gifted quarterback to ever wear a Kansas state uniform. So um, he picked the right time to get this job. It's kind of what I said even before they made the offensive coordinator hire, right? Because I think it's as easy as this. Avery Johnson is the type of quarterback that will make any offensive coordinator look pretty good. Yep. No, I think that's true. And it'll it'll cover up some warts at times. And the key for, for Connor Riley, in all honesty, then, is that he does his best to cover up what warts Avery Johnson may have at times. And I, I think that, obviously, with a quarterback as talented as Avery Johnson has already proven to be, the opportunity will be there. Another key piece to Avery Johnson at quarterback now is the fact that Matt Wells is on the staff and he's working in the co-offensive coordinator role with Connor Riley. This is what Connor Riley said on the addition of Matt Wells. Significantly, you know, not only from his experience uh, as an offensive coordinator previously, but also his experience as a head coach and his experience of having that vantage point from – a number of different chairs from a position coach to a coordinator to a head coach uh, to obviously being in our league a year ago I think is extremely beneficial uh, he's just an absolute joy to be around quite honestly Fitzy we've just begun digging into the football aspect of it because previous three weeks we've obviously been on the road recruiting so I'm just really excited about this month of February to see uh, what kind of additional value that he can bring to the offense i feel like there's there's no doubt that the experience of matt wells is beneficial we've also talked about already when the hire happened his successfulness with quarterbacks in the past i mean he was really the guy that unlocked jordan love and made him a first round pick of your packers uh so what what do you think the dynamic between these two guys will be like because now you've gotten to hear from both of them you've kind of gotten to see what the dynamic is and hear their words. How well do you think that they actually work together? Yeah, that that's probably remains to be seen. It's a work in progress. I, I don't have all the answers on that. I assume because it looked really, really genuine that it's going to work because it seems like they're connecting very well. Um, I, like when Connor Riley speaks at a press conference for those that, you know, don't, necessarily have the same vantage point as us he's one of the most genuine guys in front of a microphone that you can have um now i mean every coach covers up some stuff they're not going to be completely transparent but he is pretty far transparent pretty more a uh, much more transparent than some i mean he even talked and and he will slip in some cursing too and if you ever seen a football practice at kansas state he curses a lot but <laughs> so, and even Will Howard told us before last season when we were at Big 12 Media Days that he curses like a sailor. That's that's kind of his mojo, what he does, uh, his niche, the way he conducts himself. But I mean, he kind of lit up when he was asked about Matt Wells there. Um, you know, you're talking about just a guy in, in Connor Riley that, you know, I think works well with others just in general, too. Kind of a people person, regardless of 
you know, all the other stuff. So I, it's hard to put words to it yet because we haven't seen it. But from listening to both in the press conference, knowing that Matt Wells is hungry too. I mean, he's already talking about winning championships. And I think he's hungry to get back on that coaching ladder as well and to redeem what his career kind of face planted a little bit. Um, and probably it, to an extent, an unfair amount, by the way. Um, but he's on the he's on the rebound, and I think um he found probably a great fit for him because of his relationship with Chris Kleiman, um, his Big 12 background at this point, uh, to to kind of re-energize what his career was was doing. So and then for Connor Riley, what better guy, like he said, a former head coach, former play caller, what better guy to lean on, you know, than Matt Wells in your first year? I mean, Connor Riley's, we kind of just said this, he's kind of walking into a perfect situation a little bit for a first year primary play caller because he's doing it with a team that just two years ago won the Big 12 and last year, way eight and four, probably should have been better, brings back a lot of talent. Um, gets Avery Johnson as his quarterback and gets Matt Wells as his basically number two. Real quick, before we move on to Matt Wells and, and some comments from him last week, we talk about the, the situation with the quarterback, very, very advantageous for Connor Riley. Thinking about the offensive line situation, we talked about that earlier in the week, discussing expectations for K-State this upcoming season. And the one area of concern, of major concern, is probably – how much you have to replace on the offensive line. We don't need to rehash like, hey, these guys are gone. You're working in these guys. Just in terms of the responsibility and role, is it helpful for K-State now to have an offensive coordinator that now he's obviously familiar with the situation, as Colin Klein would have been with, hey, we lost Cooper Beebe, we lost all these guys. But is it helpful that you're going to have your offensive coordinator be an offensive line coach when you're trying to work in pretty much an entire new group or at least guys that have not played as much as the outgoing group of guys? It's a good question. And maybe it's a drawback a little bit because, you know, maybe he's stretched a little wider now, right? And, and that is less focus on the offensive line, more as the offense as a whole when that's a group that you're really trying to replace, probably more pieces. You do bring back a few, but you do have to – replace more pieces. It's probably the top question mark on the offense entering the season that and tight end maybe, but you feel good about Garrett Oakley at least. So it'll be interesting to see if there is any positive or negative uh, effects from Connor Riley going from not the offensive coordinator to the offensive coordinator. Do they still get that positional development? that they had showcased year after year. He's an excellent offensive line coach. He's probably going to be an excellent offensive coordinator if, if I was to guess. Um, how well can he marry those two things? That's a question. And and if it and if they can address it or they notice something here and there, how quick are they to say Brian LePac? Maybe that, you know, has a little bit more of a involvement there as well then to to, to kind of help bridge that gap. I don't know. It'll be it'll be interesting. I don't know. I can say, oh, yeah, that's that's actually a plus or it's it's a positive. But I could see where it could be a negative in a year where you're trying to bring along more guys to replace the outgoing guys. So we'll see. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to think about it because I, I there could be positives in the understanding, but you're right, there could be drawbacks in how hands on and how much time might have to be devoted somewhere. And 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 knowing his offensive line as well as he does could allow him to know at times during the game what to call and when to call it. It's true. Right? Because a lot it a lot works around what your offensive line is and what it isn't. Yeah, that's a good point. You spoke of Matt Wells earlier and and telling, "Hey, this is why I came to K-State." He was heavy on talking about he used baseball analogies left and right, saying, hey, K-State's a tough back. out. You're yeah, back. exactly, yeah. Uh, tough out, and they're always in it, and they're going to play meaningful football in November. Here's his uh, comments and what he described as his why on choosing K-State. 0 for 4, and for me, uh, against them, um, one win as a player. But um, 0 for 4, coach, and, you know, just since Tech in Oklahoma, and, um, man, you these guys are – they're in the mix every game, 
And that's, you know, coming here, that's part of it too, going back to your question. You get a chance to win a championship every year. I mean, Kansas State will be in the mix in the month of November. They'll be playing meaningful games. I mean, it's real around here, and the, the chance to go chase a championship together is real, and it, that's, that's also part of my why. So, I mean, you talked about the, the composure and basically stage presence of those guys when they talk. Matt Wells obviously has it. They were both, I think, comfortable in their own way. Connor Riley was just pretty laid back down to talk Relax. with everybody. Matt Wells was like, I'm going to control this thing. Like, it was, it was intense, but in a good way. And you hear there, like, he, he knows what K-State's all about. And obviously, you talked about his personal motivations, too. Like, this is a guy that has been a Power 5 head coach. He doesn't want his career to end with, you know, two and a half lackluster seasons in Lubbock where you, you're right. He, he probably was unfairly treated there because, I mean, they made a hire that didn't seem to be a fit for him at the time. And then two and a half years later, what do you know? They're like, oh, yeah, this is, a, this is not a good fit for us. And they brought in a guy that is a great fit for them in Joy McGuire. So uh, and, and give and us they a little five, more on Matt Wells. And they were five and two at the time. Yeah. Just lost to be five and three. Yeah. Um, made a bowl game that year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's not like Texas Tech, and Texas Tech hasn't made a lot of bowl games. So um, it was interesting. I, that was probably best for both parties still. Texas Tech, not a fit, never was a fit. They probably should, you know, it, it, something sometimes those things happen, right? Uh, the, both, both sides probably benefited from that decision, anyways, even if it was like a little over over the top for how his career manifested itself after that, then went to Oklahoma to be an analyst. Uh, and, and obviously now in Manhattan, I think he's driven. Like, I think he wants to prove that he's a better coach than where his, the trajectory went. Um, but I also think he has some personal pride there too and, and, and enjoyment, right? He didn't want to just be an analyst. He probably did, doesn't want to be just a quarterback's coach either. So I'm not sure how long-term this is, but – it sounds like, I mean, he's saying the right things. He got that stage presence probably because he was a head coach for so long. Before that at Utah State, the one win as a player he mentioned, um, he played for Utah State, I guess, in the early 1990s on the team that beat Kansas State. So um, there's that part to it. I, I think he's I think he's hungry. I think, I think he really is hungry. And I really think that he's excited to be at Kansas State because he went through, you know, the Texas Tech thing. And now at Oklahoma, they actually didn't get to play for a championship while he was there. And obviously he was an on-field coach. Now he feels like he's an on-field coach now for a team that can win a championship. Um, I, I don't – you could tell, like, he – a lot of energy um, that he's really pouncing on an opportunity that he has been given <clears throat> and that those couple years off were probably a good thing. And kind of reshifted everything for him, and now he's ready to roll. Yeah, I think uh, I, it's. I think for some of these guys, it's good to get a little bit of a break and take a step back, and then get back into it. And it seems like things are off to a decent start, but obviously games have not been played uh, overall. With these two guys in charge of the K State offense and playing a major role, where do you expect the the output of them to be this season? Uh, in terms of what? Well, I mean, you can either quantify it in statistical output or, you know, how many times a, how many times during the course of the 2024 season in a game will there be three threads started simultaneously on KSO saying something like, this is an offense or, you know, something something condescending like that? How many times does that happen? I guess we'll put it uh, in, in a way that, that is easy for you and uh, all the, the viewers and readers out there to understand. Yeah, I mean, it's still going to be a few times. I, I, I think you can have probably the. I mean, I said I. It's funny because I said you could probably have the top offense in the Big Twelve and still get a few of those. Well, Kansas State literally did last year. Um, from a metric standpoint, had the top offense in the Big Twelve, and we certainly had that. Now the Oklahoma State game, I think it was pretty deserving. Um, outside of that, probably not. And you're going to have those, and it, it'll there'll be some of that, especially some growing pains, right? Um. I, I can foresee something like to the Tulane or Arizona game where they hit a wall a little bit, right? And it's like, eh. uh, just because those are early games against teams that can really compete their butts off against you. Um, so those will probably be challenging. Look, we added in the Pot-Tarts Bowl. Connor Riley called a great game for three quarters. He didn't call a great game in the third quarter and 
You know, it was he's terrible, right? All over again. So it's going to happen. Um, but the maturation and the development of Avery Johnson will cover up some of that as well. Yeah, that's a good point on uh, the Pop Tarts Bowl and and kind of what went down there. Uh, and if you go and look at it, the 28 points that K State scored in the Pop Tarts Bowl. Um, that was, that was the third most points scored on NC state's defense this season. Uh, the only teams to score more was Notre Dame. They put up 45 Marshall put up 41, although NC state won that game 48 to 41. I'd be wildly intrigued to know what went down in that game for Marshall to score 41. Uh, and then say, Virginia tech also put up 28. I will say, I think, uh, I don't I don't know if it's yards per player, points per drive, one of those, uh, Kansas State had the most on NC State all year. I could the, the points per drive would make sense. I mean, it was a pretty limited possession yeah. type of game. So I, I think it makes sense there. And look, I, I thought I thought that it was a good showing in the Pop Tarts Bowl for the two things people were most interested in. Connor Riley at OC and Avery Johnson at quarterback. There are things that they can be better about. They can build off of it, and that's what you take going into 2024. And you bring in a very capable guy and another voice that, in Matt Wells, has success with individuals and teams in the past and obviously knows what it takes. And I think that's a guy – he knows what it takes to win in the Big 12. He just didn't have it at Texas Tech. And, I, you know, some of that is on him, but also there's a lot of that there that is not his fault. Yeah, well, Matt Wells, what we do know is he's a great quarterback coach. So Avery Johnson's in good hands. So that's one thing. Two, Connor Riley kind of said this during that press conference as well, that the offense really hasn't changed from Fargo to Manhattan, right? And Fargo, they had Courtney Messingham's system, and then he brought it to Manhattan, tweaked it a little bit, and that was Courtney Messingham. Or that was the that was the offense. Then Colin Klein comes in as an offense coordinator. He said the offense was really the same, and then each offense coordinator just puts their own flair to it. So Connor Riley will do the same. What I hope and what I think is going to happen is that his flavor, his tweaks are probably more aligned with Colin Klein than Courtney Messingham. I think you have to have a certain pace to kind of get through. I, I don't know if the Courtney Messingham pace and um, run pass ratio is really what it can. I don't know if that's a is that that's effective enough. I think the ratio probably has to look more like the Klein thing. The pace has to more look like the Klein one. And what I do know is this. I do think they'll have all that. I expect it to look more like the Klein one than the Messingham one, but I also expect less quarterback run, at least designed quarterback run. Well, you think about it, on this coaching staff now, you have coaches that have – I mean, how many NFL quarterbacks is that at this point uh, now that they have? Because you've got, obviously, the stable of North Dakota State guys with – Stick. Uh, Wentz, Stick, and and Trey Lance was there for a season. He redshirted their last year at North Dakota State. Jordan Love, uh, obviously, and Skylar Thompson. So there's there's a lot of understanding there with how uh, the quarterback position works. Did, and did he have a did he did he send a tech quarterback to the NFL? I guess he wasn't there long enough, maybe to. Yeah, but. I don't know that uh, any anybody out there. I, Alan Bowman, though, he might eventually be one. Uh, well, if Ty, I just Ty, doubt him hard enough. Or is Tyler Shuck now? He's still in Lubbock, right? Yeah. Uh, no, he moved on. Uh, cause I think they're, I think they're officially moving on right. Or maybe he is still there. I don't know. Uh, Louisville, he, Tyler Shuck went to Louisville. Yeah. Yeah. I knew that that, cause I think Wells was the one that initially brought in Tyler Shuck, right? Yeah. Well, just like any Texas tech quarterback over the last 10 years, if, if he could play more than four games in a season, maybe he, he would have been a really good quarterback. We'll just never know. Yeah. So. Cause he had to go because of Tyler Shuck. He would, he had to go to Henry Columbia. Yeah, Columbia played. Uh, well, Jet Duffy, John Kurtz's favorite Texas Tech quarterback, uh, had to get time. There were a lot of them. He he had to play a lot of quarterbacks, as every Tech coach has seemingly had to do over the last however many years. So, kind of wild. Uh, let's close it out. I I've, I you, I know you're wearing somebody. What what shirt you got on today? Is it it's orange? Okay, Clemson represent. Uh, I'm 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 showing off for Dream Dowling and uh, Tyler Perry with uh, North Texas. So <laughs> go mean green. Uh, that's a a good way to end the show there, and uh, we'll get out of here. Nice tight thirty minutes talking K State football for everybody. Plenty more K State football coverage over at K State Online. So 
Find us on On3. Also, stay subscribed to the YouTube and podcast platforms. We'll have plenty of coverage, not just of football, but obviously basketball as we get towards the weekend. Major matchup with a quad one opponent in TCU coming to town. Actually, that might be quad two. It'll be it'll be iffy on that, but it'll be a good game nonetheless. Big opportunity for K-State as they try and get back on the right side of the bubble. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online.